to say a quick thank you to the sponsor of this video, Noble Gold Investments. Thank you for sponsoring a dangerous channel, a, a demonetized channel on YouTube for, I guess, preaching Jesus and truth and everything else that is banned on, on YouTube. But thank you again, Noble Gold. If you're looking for gold or silver or gold and silver IRAs, check them out. Great platform. Very patriotic. I recommend. Um, okay, without further ado, J uh, Jason, actually, before I get Jason on, I want to read this to you because this is an opinion piece that he wrote recently. And it's excellent. This is going to basically, he's going to explain what this all means. A decision that could change everything. On November 3rd, after more than two decades of confusion, the Fourth Circuit Court finally clarified the proper interpretation and application of its own 1997 Zeron versus AOL Inc. They correctly held CDAs, uh, Section 230C1, does not stretch to include actions such as content moderation that exceed basic formatting or procedural publishing functions, example, passive hosting functions. Simply put, Section 230C1 only applies to passive hosting, not content moderation. Ah, Big Tech's glass house has finally cracked Section 230C1, is not licensed to do whatever it wants on Line to be clear, Section 230 uh, 230C1 does not Im immunize all publishing decisions. Formatting or procedural functions are not active publishing decisions. They are the passive service functions of a publishing service, not the active publishing function of an information content provider. The Fourth Circuit Court distinguished between the two types of publishing functions: passive procedural. Uh, slash service functionality and active publishing, which is content moderation functionality. In other words, simply put, 230C1 does not apply to a service provider's publishing decisions, content moderation. I'm going to have Jason on right now and explain this. Jason, this is huge. I know when this when you, when you when this decision came out in the Fourth Circuit Court, you messaged me you're like, Anna, this is huge. So explain that. I mean, what happened on November 3rd? Essentially, if I were to just really boil this down for, for, you know, the simplest way to explain it, the Fourth Circuit Court determined or basically distinguished the difference between a platform and a publisher. That's really what they did. Mm -hmm. um, in the circumstance, what, what was happening is this portion that we keep talking about here, 230C1, it was, it was essentially acting as a catch-all for everything. It was just absolute immunity from everything. And, and it was based on this original case, Iran versus America Online. And the Fourth Circuit Court revisited that same case that they had held, you know, 20, what is it, 26 years ago now? And they re-clarified it and said, no, 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 no. It only has to do with publishing functionality, meaning the service itself. Whereas the other portion now is correctly working for content moderation, which means that they they actually have to act in good faith. It completely changed the game. And more specifically, everything we talked about, remember that long, you know, what you mentioned at the beginning of this, her original, you know, uh, uh, you know, episode, what was it, almost two hours mm -hmm. long? We walked through everything, right? Yeah. What two essentially, hours. yeah, it was two hours long. And and everybody, of course, you know, is trying to catch up because it's complicated. We get it. It's It's very complicated. But the point is, is that that interview was correct. Mm. That's what the Fourth Circuit just did. We have we've been struggling to get a win anywhere because we keep getting dismissed. But the point is, they wouldn't look at it from the very beginning. What's called de novo, a, a new. And now that they have looked at it, they essentially said, you know what, you're right. And and it, it's amazing. So it's huge. <laughs> the good thing about today is, is I actually have Jeffrey Graber with me, my attorney. He doesn't usually get as much time to come into these things, but he can tell you a little bit more about the technical side of this thing with, with regards to, you know, the application of this is, is immense. I mean, it, it changes the game. Yeah. Jeffrey, it's so good to have you as well. I mean, the, you were here last time with us as well. I mean, can you clarify, so, I mean, from a, from a logistic and I should say a legal point of view, what this means to have the uh, fourth circuit court make actually drop such a bomb on big tech. Sure. Thanks for having us again, Anne. I really appreciate you. Right. Um, so it means two things to me. Number one, it means we've been dead on, spot on, correct for about five or six years. And it's nice that one court has finally recognized reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but scaling out from that personal perspective, what it means is for sure, 
we have a circuit court conflict. We've got the wacky Ninth Circuit, primarily out of California. I, I've Listen, I call a fig a fig. I've never seen a worse judiciary in 16 years, and I practice in 23 jurisdictions across the country. Um, and they've been hammering people like Jason Fick in favor of big tech and their Silicon Valley home turf for decades. Now swoops in the Fourth Circuit out of a court emanating out of North Carolina. The Fourth Circuit is composed of Virginia, North Carolina, a couple other states. Finally saying what 230 is, what it means, um, how it's applied, how it's interpreted. And so we absolutely have a circuit conflict now between the Fourth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit. And I would even argue between the Fifth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit. And I would even argue between the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit. So what it means is the Supreme Court of the United States of America might just want to finally hear us mm. and do the right thing. Just like Clarence Thomas with Enigma started with in his advisory opinion statement about a year, year and a half ago, uh, he was on, on the right track and the rest of SCOTUS needs to recognize that and finally make things correct. And a circuit, a circuit conflict is procedurally um, absolutely like the numero uno way to make it into SCOTUS. Amazing. I mean, this is such an open door. Uh, would you remind people, Jason as well, and, and Jeffrey, what J Jason's lawsuit is really about in regards to Section 230 and the and the immunization as well, um, the Good Samaritan Clause. Can you just really do a quick brief overview for anyone that didn't watch our previous episode? By the way, again, if you're just tuning in, you definitely want to watch that first episode I did with Jason because he goes through Section 230 and the unconstitutionality behind it and how we can actually defeat it, not just by suing on the grounds of the First Amendment, right? Because they have a right as a private company to take off and remove anyone that they don't want or don't like. But under the clause of Good Samaritan, um, can you explain that? And you actually have a really great basis of a lawsuit. And this is why you're having congressmen back you now because they realize you really have a fighting chance to overturn Section 230. Explain explain your case in, in a brief nutshell. Well, there's a couple things that, that you touched on there. People need to understand the difference between a First Amendment right and a statutory privilege. They're two separate things. Their right is, is that, yes, they can take the content down and by eliminating or, or changing or whatever they want to do with Section 230, that doesn't change their right. It, it doesn't change their con the constitutionality of it. What it does is it changes the privilege that they get, the authority that they get from government. Now, what happened to me originally, I mean, the reason why we went after Facebook is because their business model, most people don't realize this, but the algorithm, the business model, everything that they do, by definition, makes them a content provider. But the courts have yet to see that because, I mean, it, it's kind of like ludicrous to say, well, what do they do? Well, they're providing new content, but we're not supposed to call them a content provider. They are. That's what they do. They, they're they not just it's not just a platform that, you know, allows you to go find your own content. They specifically feed it to you. Right. I mean, yeah. fact checks, all those things. Those that's content provision. And the thing was, is that. They took my stuff down. They took my pages down. And, of course, they would try to claim that it was somehow offensive or whatever and protected under Section 230. But I caught them. What happened was is we tried to get them reinstated uh, through a, a competitor of mine. And the competitor, you know, they said, well, no, we're not going to do it for Jason, but they would do it for the competitor. So when I transferred the pages to the competitor, lo and behold, all the content that was supposedly bad was actually reinstated for the competitor. And one of the fourth, fourth uh, things that the Fourth Circuit just clarified is it has to be about improper content. If there's no content at issue, 230C1 does not apply. My case was dismissed on 230C1, and there is no content at issue because the same content that was supposedly offensive wasn't. But that's not what happened in Enigma. Enigma was a whole different thing, and I'll actually let Jeff talk a little bit more about the Good Samaritan General Provision on Enigma. That was a, that's a big change. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Legally, you'll, you'll note that section 230C at the start, not 230C1, not 230C2, 230 at the top starts with th the threshold words, good Samaritan. As Jason said, that's a general provision or an intelligible principle, uh, same word, uh, same concept. And what it means is everybody that seeks the civil liability protection, big tech seeking the civil liability protection, immunization of Section 230 at the threshold 
before any more consideration is given to their immunization quest, they must be a good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And what Enigma said was, that's the law. And I'm sorry to interrupt. That's the law that was passed by Congress. That's right. That's just, Congress. So, just so it's clear for everybody. Yeah, that was the law. So in order uh, yeah, to have these rights to be able to take off and, and you know, allow content on or, or delete people, you have to fall under Good Samaritan, that you're helping your community in a way, whether it's pedophilia and, and started off with right pedophilia, taking off any porn um, sites and, and, and accounts. And then it it they didn't there was no limit. That was just their open door to be able to take off anyone they choose in general. But continue the Good Samaritan clause. Yeah, no doubt. And Section 230C2 even has kind of a parallel phrase, good faith. I mean, it, it, good Samaritanism, good faith, it's inextricably intertwined with all of 230C. And it's and, objective. And, 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 yes. And Enigma, <laughs> the decision that Jason's alluding to, a very good decision. It's the one where Justice Clarence Thomas issued a 10-page statement, basically an advisory opinion. Um, what they absolutely determined, and th these were actually California courts, this actually was the Ninth Circuit and the Northern District of California District Court. They determined that the antithesis, the complete opposite of good Samaritanism is anti-competition, anti-competitive animus, it's called. And Jason had as one of his counts, crystal clearly, um, violation of California's unfair competition codes that is spot on with anti-competition. It's like the state version of uh, you know, monopolization. And absolutely his case should have continued forward just on that. And Enigma does say that. You cannot be a good Samaritan on one hand and an anti-competitor on another hand. It, it doesn't work. Um, so that's how I, Enigma got some justice, at least through... Um, the ninth Just circuit yeah it really comes down to the motivation the the motivation see people don't realize there is a general motivation to the entire statute now you think that i mean gen you know a general provision would be applied generally but of course we have struggled with these california courts don't seem to want to do their job because the northern district of california court when we went back to them and said look this doesn't make any sense there's a kind of conflict here they said that well somehow good samaritan only applies to 230c2 not 230c1 which is ludicrous it it, it provide you know presides over the entire statute and when we when we really nailed it down i mean i, I think jeff can agree with me we we had them cornered in a catch-22 going into the ninth and what do they do they pivot and they threw us out on a procedural so they're less interested in actually fixing their own mistakes and they're not interested in actually justice i mean I should have never had to go through this, but they do not want to do the job. And they didn't consider it de novo anew. The Fourth mm -hmm. Circuit just did that. Now, it, it really is going to come down to whether the Supreme Court does this. And, and I mean, the, the whole nation should be paying attention to this because this is really important. This will determine whether freedom of speech exists online or not. I mean, that's really what it's going to come down to. Yeah, and so we're hoping again with this decision, uh, with this Fourth Circuit Court that the Supreme Court now pick up this issue and hopefully strike down this unconstitutional uh, provision. And I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a you know legal expert, um, but this this law of of uh, you know Good Samaritan Section 230 clause. So we're hoping that it gets st struck down as unconstitutional because in, in every way it is. You know, it, it sounded like a, a good thing, but again, good faith, good Samaritan. It's all subjective. And it's unconstitutional. And so, Jason, can you explain why some of the other lawsuits uh, fell through? I mean, you know, we touched on it a little bit, but the other lawsuits that that were um, that were suing in the in, in the in the courts as well against you know First Amendment, um, even even Donald Trump's lawsuit kind of also flared out. So, how wh why is that? Why why is your case better than the other cases presented? So, in in the circumstances um, where somebody brings a First Amendment claim. Right. And this just recently happened in, I believe it was Doe versus Google. I, I, I sat in and believe it or not, we were actually supposed to be in the same oral, arg oral arguments that day, but they had kicked us out of oral arguments. And I really think that it, they don't specifically want to fix it. That's why they're kicking us out, because there is really no way to challenge what we're saying. I mean, the, the, we, we've got it right. Um, 
but in that circumstance, they were suing on First Amendment grounds, but they were suing Google. And the judge made a point that, you know, it, it, they were correct. I mean, they said, well, if you can bridge the gap that they are, in fact, acting as a state actor, and this is something that everybody needs to understand, you don't sue Google. You don't sue Facebook. You have to sue the government. The government. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, of course, you know, what we did. I mean, when, when the United States, and this is a strange thing because we're dealing with the United States Attorney General right now. And it's amazing because I'll just read you a, a one line quote he said. He said, moreover, plaintiff has articulated no theory at all as to how a ruling that Section 230 is unconstitutional would have redressed whatever injuries he believes Facebook caused him. He doesn't seem to understand. We're not suing the United States in a constitutional challenge for what Facebook did to me. We sued Facebook for that. Mm -hmm. It was the United States government. They passed a law. They then, the executive branch, signed that law. And then the judiciary enforced that law. And they said, well, no, the, the judiciary is not enforcing Section 230. No, they're not removing content, but they are enforcing the immunity. And that's what they did to me. It's their actions that we're going after. And they don't seem to know who's who. I mean, you know, the, the, the California courts didn't know the difference between Facebook's actions and my actions. They were said I was treating them as me. Effectively, that's, that's what they're saying here. It's, it's a bizarre sort of fight. But there are these other cases that are floating out there. Uh, I know um, Jeff might be able to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the Fifth Circuit Court um, because that created yet another conflict with us. Um, and I'll leave it to Jeff, you know, some of these other cases that we've been working on, you know, that sort of tie in and tie out, you know, the ninth against the ninth is a hard thing to get the Supreme Court to look at. But these these circuit court conflicts that are popping up and the reason they're popping up, at least in my opinion, it's because it's wrong. We, we've got it right. It would all fit if, if our stuff goes on. But I'll leave it to you, Jeff. Well, I mean, that I don't have much to add other than to say the Fifth Circuit decision. What was it, Jason? Uh, Jerkeski? Am I pronouncing yeah. that right? Yeah, I think it's Jerkesi. Jerkesi yeah. versus SEC, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that case basically finally set the record straight on what an intelligible principle or a general provision is supposed to be. And you don't just willy-nilly gloss over that, especially when it comes to like a 230C, where the very first words above everything – are your intelligible principle and general provision. That is what defines the interpretation and the application of all the immunity considerations that flow therefrom. And so Jarkesi versus SEC, if we're saying that right, it's, it's one of many supplemental cases we put before the ninth. And Jason hasn't even mentioned this yet because we had it so dead to rights, no way to quarrel with what we were saying as to what 230C immunity really is. The Ninth Circuit issues a three-page opinion saying that we were too late, too late asking for reconsideration, so they never even gave us substantive consideration. And then we put the Fourth Circuit decision in front of the Ninth, and they issued one word, denied. It, it's a joke. It is a joke what's happening in the California judiciary, except for Enigma, where I don't know if someone was just throwing darts against the wall blindfolded and they got it right. But um, Jarkesi versus the SEC was just simply – very honed in a very good opinion on the proper application of a general provision, intelligible principle. Um, Actually, there was another uh, Fifth Circuit decision when they were doing the Texas HB 20 case. And the, the, the big case? takeaway. Yeah. So, so it was, well, it was, yeah. it was about the HB 20 law in Texas. And, and the big takeaway there was, and, and of, of course, nobody reports this stuff. The big takeaway was, is that, you know, if they do publishing themselves, it's First Amendment protected. If they consider content pre-publishing, it's a First Amendment protected right because they are expressing themselves. But the court determined that if they remove content post-publishing, it's straight censorship because it's not expression, it's suppression. It's not First Amendment protected. The AG, the uh, United States Attorney General, just said that, you know, that, that's a First Amendment protected activity. Hmm. Well... The Fifth Circuit doesn't believe that it is. So, I mean, there's a lot of conflict going on. And, and I think what it is is that, you know, some of your audience may not understand what we're talking about because it, it is very complex. But the point is, is that there are those of us out there that are actually understanding this stuff and that no matter how much they try to confuse people, mm -hmm. we've got it. We understand it. The question now is, will the Supreme Court do something about it? That's yeah. where everybody be lending in. Jeff. 
You know what's not complex for Anna's audience to understand? 230 doesn't immunize what's otherwise illegal in the real world. Straight away. Big tech, just because they're floating around in some magical ether called the internet, doesn't enjoy, quote, a legal no man's land, a sovereign immunity of sorts, as if they're invincible, can't be touched. Mm -hmm. If their conduct is illegal, it doesn't enjoy 230 immunization. But the way the court systems have spiraled 230 immunization out of control for 26 years, approaching 27 years, and Justice Clarence Thomas points out the ridiculousness of the questionable precedent that lies before us. But what is not difficult to understand is that they defrauded Jason. They tortiously interfered with his economic advantage. They civilly stole from him. They engaged in unfair competition under California code or federal code. We don't care. And that doesn't enjoy immunity. Um, it's ridiculous. It does get complex procedurally. It gets mm -hmm. complex only because wackadoodle courts have made it complex. Um, but at the root, it's very, very simple. This law does not immunize illegalities outside the magical internet ether. It's Jeffrey, insanity. Uh, correct. Um, Jeffrey, would you mind explaining this decision by the Fourth Circuit Court where in, in their terminology, what they're saying? So what's the difference between you know passive and active publishing content? I mean, I would love for you to just even what 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 is not immune that the section um, that the Fourth Circuit Court? You, you know, I I don't have uh, too much pride. Um, I'm I'm not ashamed to kick this back to Jason. I honestly think Jason's yes. in the best position to address that question, Anna. He's okay. the guru when it comes to publishing, distributing, passive, <laughs> active. Jason's the man. Let's talk with Jason on that. Yeah, and actually, Jason wrote this opinion piece. So, Jason, go ahead. What did you mean by, uh, you know, uh, explain what they what, what the Fourth Circuit Court actually said in their decision? So what happened was this this case that they're talking about, Saran versus America Online, right? It's the first case that ever decided this way back in the day, 1997. They made a statement in there where it said all, that Section 230C1, right? Now, for everybody that understands 230C1, that's the first portion that says no provider user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. We all understand what that means. It means they can't be treated as somebody else. It's very simple, correct? Well, mm -hmm. what they did was they took the words the publisher and they converted it into a publisher and they use them synonymously. They're not synonymous because one is what's called a definite article and the other one is called an indefinite article. And what that does is it means that when the Zoran court determined this, they said that 230C1 protects all publishing decisions, whether to leave content up, take it down, or edit it. So I'm I'm just right there, I'm paraphrasing, that it covers everything. Well, it doesn't. It actually, in fact, doesn't cover any publishing decisions. The Fourth Circuit said, no, when we were talking about that, essentially, and I'm just sort of summarizing it, they said, no, it only covers formatting or procedural functions, meaning you know, it's a service, right? What kind of service is it? It's a publishing service. So are they publishers? Yes. That's why that publisher argument never makes any sense because they're always a publisher. They're always an information content provider. But there's a difference between a passive publishing where the service is doing the actions. They're not doing like the individuals. Think of it like this way. If it's a service provider, the service is one thing. The provider is another. Like a Mark Zuckerberg is the provider, whereas right. the service is the Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. Formatting and procedural functions are like your stuff that that sorts out and your your more algorithmic and like your like button. That's all publishing, but it's passive, right? It's formatting and procedural functions. So they made it where 230C1 now actually fits a platform where they're not engaged in any kind of content moderation, right? That's what we mean by passive. They're not involved in any kind of active decisions. The second portion where it says that they can restrict materials, right, in good faith, has almost never applied because 230C1 swallowed it. If you can't be treated as a publisher and all publishing decisions are covered, that includes restricting materials, right? Makes sense. So what they said there is that the active functions, when you substantively contribute, now, everybody thinks, oh, well, they must have changed it. They had to edit it. They had to. No, that's modification. There's a difference. Development is manipulation. 
They only have to change it. That's what they did to me. They de-developed it, and then they solicited a new owner, and then they redeveloped it. Well, that's that's all actions by Facebook, right? By by actual like the Zuckerbergs, the people. That's not service. The service didn't do that, and that's what we're saying here is that once, as soon as they get into any kind of content moderation, any kind of manipulation of the content, they're on the hook for what happens. Which means mm. that, for example, like we want to stop a lot of this pedophilia and this nonsense that's going on, right? Well, that's what essentially Gonzalez is looking at. You know, the Supreme Court's looking at this Gonzalez uh, Section 230 case. What happens if they knowingly allow content? Mm. Well, isn't that an active decision? They're choosing to show it, right? Now, yeah. if they choose to show something, that's an active publishing decision. That would only apply to 230C2 in a proper context. Does that make this a little bit more understandable? Like it does. there's two different types of functionality of a publisher, passive and active. And, and Jason, kind of in the same vein as passive and active is the first party, third party twist. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Anna, the, the most classic, true application of 230C1 immunity uh, was, was your defamation type case. Um, John Smith sues Facebook for something Jane Anderson said on Facebook. No, no, Facebook doesn't have to answer for that. That's absolutely ridiculous. Sure. Facebook enjoys immunity. However, mm -hmm. in this case, it's Jason Fick versus Facebook. The first situation, your classic defamation scenario, that's third party. That's John's beef with Jane. Great. Keep Facebook out. No place for that. On the other hand, when you deal with a first party scenario like Jason Fick, where they actively, purposefully, anti-competitively crushed him, Mm -hmm. That's the first party scenario that does not enjoy immunity under 230C1. And it's sort of on the same track as passive versus active. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And and see, the thing is about the section portion, the second portion that says 230C2, it only allows them to do one type of active move, which is to restrict offensive materials in good faith. And courts have taken that and said, well, not only can they restrict it, but they can make new content and they, I mean, they can be the content, for, no, they can't, Con, you know, that, that comes in where policy and procedure, you know, is relying upon what Congress intended and Congress only intended to give them the ability to remove harmful content. And, and its original intent was to protect children from harm. That was its original intent. But obviously, as we know, they took it all the way. That's what, you know, you always say you give the devil an inch, he takes a mile and he won't stop taking um amen well thank you guys is there anything else you wanted to mention before we uh wrap this up uh yeah well we actually um jeff and i you know we we started working on uh i know jeff does a lot of representation for us but the social media freedom foundation uh you yes. can actually see the link just below me right here the socialmediafreedom.org you know this is a very expensive fight this is difficult i mean just just the supreme court you know and remember we're fighting for you I mean, legitimately, this goes way beyond the you know the two of us, and and, and I have to mention too, Connie Constance Yu, who is our, our our other attorney in this. I mean, she's put in a ton of time, and realistically, we need the support to be able to fight for all of you. This is a legit fight, and this is not you know we're not out there trying to you know become famous or any. No, we just need to get through this for everyone. So if if you can go to socialmediafreedom.org, you know, there's a lot more information there that you can read up on, but you know, mm -hmm. help contribute. Because we've got to get through this fight to the end, and I know this is a, a difficult fight. Um, and also in May, uh, and I'd actually like to invite you, uh, Anna, uh, May 11th through 13th, we are going to be doing an event called the Internet, uh, uh, Internet Equality Summit in Palm Springs, California, at the Esmeralda from May 11th through 13th. And uh, I'd like to invite you out there, but uh, I'll leave the, the a lot. I would love to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I haven't been since I was 13. And can you imagine why I don't want to go back? Mm -hmm. But uh, Jeff, uh, any last, you know, thoughts? Uh, no, I just I, I echo that, um, you know, in, in the thick versus Facebook case, we're going back to SCOTUS. Just the, the 45 books alone or 40 books alone that we need to submit to the SCOTUS are thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, I think, as Jason briefly mentioned, we have a constitutional challenge going on in the District of District Columbia Court. That filing itself was 140 pages, took us 10 months to draft. 
We've been at this with Jason's lawsuit since August 2018, predicated on October 2016 harm. I mean, we've been embroiled in this and we're ahead of the curve, ahead of the Fourth Circuit decisions, ahead of everything for five or six years. And Jason has the perfect case to finally hammer home what 230 is supposed to be, which is what the Fourth Circuit said it's supposed to be. And uh, we could use some support. That would be appreciated. California mm-hmm. event would be nice. And most importantly, Anna, thank you so much. And good luck with getting back on YouTube. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, hey, it is you what it who, is. You know who to call if there's, <laughs> if there's problems. Actually, well, I, well, I want to thank you guys. I really thank you guys because you really are front lines and you really are fighting this battle. A lot of people, as you know, have given up. They're like, well, it's a done deal. It's a it's case closed. Can't be fixed. No. You can't, it can't be fixed. And you really are showing that you, you actually have a really great case. Again, for those that are just tuning in, check out the first episode. It's on my YouTube on Anna Kane on YouTube. I've got two strikes. They're hanging on by string, but the interview is amazing. And Jason really goes through it. And actually Jason sends an interview to congressmen and, and other people to explain what section 230, what the constitution, the, the unconstitutionality behind it and, and the basis of their case, which really has legs to stand on. So I want to thank you guys for fighting the fight. And and I, I second when they're mentioning about supporting this. I mean, I put my money where my mouth is. I've also donated to uh, their, you know, their organization and, and what they're you. doing, their fight, this legal case. So put your money where your mouth is. You want to support these guys, so even if it's a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. This is a they're, they're fighting on behalf of the American people. And right. the American people who either have no time to go through it and no money to go through, we're we're gathering money together to be able to fight this fight because I am pretty sure, after, especially after this Fourth Circuit uh, made this decision, that we will probably see this in the Supreme Court. We're praying for that scenario that it goes into the Supreme Court. But Jason, Jeffrey, God bless you guys. You are amazing. We thank you again for for being such valiant supporters and also patriots, American constitutional supporters and patriots. So we bless you guys. Have a wonderful night. And hopefully we have an update soon on your case as well and the Supreme Court. Thank you, Anna. Be well. Be well, guys. Bye. Take care.